humans to do is to sit and hold a little bit of silence to reflect and if you'll notice uh, worship services usually are created to eliminate all silent dead space <laughs> even to the point of transitioning between songs we try and transition quickly so there's no dead space no silent space but if you're have any experience with Jesus like mine has been, it's often been in the dead space, in the silent space, where his voice is the loudest. So just for a moment, it'll feel like eternity, but I promise it won't be. We're just going to hold a little bit of silent space. Holy Spirit, speak as we listen to your voice. Lord God, we thank you this morning that here in the Father's house we can lay down our burdens. That we can know that we'll be met with grace and unconditional love. That while the journey be difficult, marked with sharp turns and elevation gains and valleys, we know that we can come to the Father's house. We can find a community of people who are on the journey together. So Lord, as we worship you this morning in word, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to speak through the scriptures beyond the message that is spoken. Lord, would you speak a word to your people, a word that is inspiring, a word that is encouraging, perhaps a word that, where we need to be challenged in life. Lord, you know what we need and you know how to deliver what we need. So would you look upon your people, see the needs of those gathered in this place. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would minister, be a good shepherd. Lord, let your people hear your voice today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. I'm not sure if, um, if that first song hit you like it hit me, but um, I was ready to go a few more courses on here in the Father's house. What a beautiful message. Here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore. I, I'm not on tune. I don't even care. You know what I mean? Here in the Father's house. Woo! Man, if I knew the rest of the words, I'd sing more of it. The slide, the slide person up there is like, I ain't putting the words up there. I know where this is going. Here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore. 
here in the Father's house. In the name of Jesus. There it is right there. Lay your burdens down. What a message to hear this morning. Does anybody carry a burden in their life? A personal burden, a burden for your children, for your grandkids, an estranged relationship. Does anybody got a burden in the house of the Lord this morning? To hear the winsome, non-religious invitation of Jesus to come and lay your burdens down. Take my yoke upon you for it's easy and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I'll never place something too heavy on you. Come and learn from me. Receive from me, Jesus says. I'll be the glory and the lifter of your heads. I'll be the source of strength and hope for your journey for the day. Come and lay your burdens down. Lay your burdens down. Ooh, come on, help me out now. No, we're done. She ain't going to do it. She heard my voice cracking. She ain't going to do that. I can't encourage that. Uh, if you're new or newish, <laughs> welcome to this faith family. Amen. It is, uh, we're, we're happy to have you here this morning. Um, we would love to get, you, get to know you more beyond a Sunday morning, and one of the easiest ways for us to do that is, is with the Connect card in the seat in front of you. If you'd fill that thing out, we put whatever information you want to put on there, at least a name and an email or a number so that we can be in touch with you. We'd love to give you a call and get to know you a little bit more beyond a Sunday morning. You can put them in the black box on your way out. If, uh, if you came this morning and you didn't, you, you're like, man, I was wanting to go to Connect Track and Connect Deeper today, but I didn't quite sign up or RSVP, I'm just going to let you know, we always got a seat with somebody's name on it, and it might just be your name today. And so if you want to come, well, we're, we're waiting on you. We got the food ready. The table is spread. We are ready for you. If you want to come, Connect Deeper is, is pulling back the curtain of City First Church, looking at the structure, looking at the theology, looking at the finances. What, what is our budget? Where does the money go to? How do we handle these things? So it's really kind of that under the hood, open the closet. Let's see what's really going on behind the scenes. So if you're interested in that, that's happening today, uh, 1230 at 1052 Fairfield Avenue. Connect deeper. Um, and friends, we just got a couple things. I, I, we're going to get in the Word. Uh, trust me, we're going to get in the Word because somebody came hungry for the Word of God this morning. I know it. I know somebody did. But you need to know some things that are happening in the life of the faith family. Uh, the second is, uh, if you missed Faith Promise last week, uh, check out our YouTube link, our channel. Uh, Pastor Les did a phenomenal job talking about the, the, the size of our footprint and, and really relating that to our impact in, in missions here locally and around the world. Um, the, your Faith Promise card is in the uh, worship folder that you got when you came in. If you haven't had an opportunity yet to, to look at that and, and to prayerfully consider how you you may contribute to uh, this year's Faith Promise offering, please uh, consider that. Uh, it, 100% of it goes to funding uh, mission uh, both locally and, and globally around the world uh, through our own global partnerships and through our, our Nazarene family, which we are in 164 different world areas, over 2.5 million Nazarenes around the world worshiping in over 30,000 congregations. I mean, we're part of a bigger, we're part of a bigger family. Family who's seeking the heart of God. Amen? Amen? So if you haven't had an opportunity to look at the Faith Promise card, take a look at it and prayerfully consider uh, what you might give towards that. You can give online. There's links for that. Uh, and again, you can put those cards in the black box in the lobby on your way out. Last but not least, uh, we're going to be celebrating Easter here in a few weeks. You know that, right? Easter's a coming. Friday was here, but Sunday's a coming too. And we're going to be celebrating Easter. We have a phenomenal uh, worship service planned. It's going to be an integration of, of worship, of music, of testimony. Um, our children are going to be uh, woven into our Easter celebration at, at a couple different locations. It's going to be a beautiful, I mean, I, I just remember this scripture from Revelation that says they overcame him, which was the enemy of the soul the accuser of the brethren by the word, uh, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen. 
So we're going to have a woven together service uh, of, of Scripture talking about the blood of the Lamb and testimony from people here in our faith family with our kids helping proclaim the gospel through music. It's going to be a wonderful service. Um, the logistics of it is a little complicated. And for that reason, we're only going to have a 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Easter service here at uh, uh, the corner of 8th and Madison, okay? So our Easter services, our two Easter Easter services, due to the complex logistics, will be here at uh, the corner of 8th and Madison, meaning we won't have a service at Fairfield. But have no fear, uh, because Jesus is here, we're going to provide uh, transportation, bus services. Uh, if you need ride source help, we're going to make sure that no one is left behind who needs a ride from our Fairfield location, all right? Are we good there? All right, here we go. Oh, man, praise God. That was a mouthful, but I had to get it out. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark this morning, Mark chapter 11. It's going to be a, a, rather, a rather interesting passage of Scripture that we're going to look at. Uh, we are in uh, week two of our new series called Seven Days, which we're taking a look at the Passion Week leading up to Resurrection Sunday. Uh, that, that those seven days leading up to Resurrection Sunday in each one of our Sundays that we gather, we're looking at one of the days in the Passion Week. And, and, and the Passion Week was Jesus really uh, just demonstrating just how far and how passionate the love of God is willing to go in order to forgive people's sin and to restore them unto wholeness and relationship with God. Jesus was demonstrating the passionate love of God through the Passion Week, showing people that Jesus, the Father, the Spirit, they are willing to bleed, suffer, and die so that people could experience the hope, healing, and wholeness in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody amen to that. Jesus' passion for us demands our passionate response to him. Jesus was walking through this last life, this last week of his life, and, and we observed, we are observing his level of passion for us. And my hope for our faith family is that as we see his passion, that our passion would rise to the level of Jesus' passion for us, that, that we could take one step in our level of, of passion for Jesus, seeing just how passionate he is for us, that Jesus was willing and able and did bleed, suffer, and die in order to restore us unto relationship to him so that we might take a step in our passion for Jesus. His passion for us demands not a half-hearted, and if you look through the narrative of the Old Testament scriptures, oftentimes the prophets are calling out the half-heartedness of the people of God, and more specifically, the half-heartedness of the leadership of the people of God. And so God was wanting this wholehearted worship of, uh, of himself. And, and in fact, in one section in the Old Testament, it says that, 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 that the Father is looking, he's searching to and fro to see whose hearts are fully committed to him, that he would strengthen them. And, and so even today, the Father is looking for people's hearts who are fully committed to him. So that he would strengthen them in their relationship. So, so as we go through this, may our hearts as a faith family be fully committed in passionate relationship with Jesus. Amen. Remember, just in case you forgot, remember that of the 89 chapters that make up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 29 of those chapters are about the last week of Jesus' life. So one-third of the gospel, the, the gospels the, as a whole, are about the last week of Jesus' life, which is to tell you if, it, if, the, if the gospel writers give that much airtime to one subject, it must be a pretty important topic. And there's some complicated things in there. I ain't going to lie to you. And, and today's one of those complicated ones that, that we look at and we kind of scratch our heads and we're like, I, but why, why did he do that? 
So if you're familiar with the gospel of Mark, uh, go ahead and turn there. Chapter 11, we're going to read verses 12 through 21. This is uh, Tuesday of Passion Week. All right, so Jesus has made the triumphal entry. Monday, that happened on Sunday. Monday has, has happened. Now, Tuesday of Passion Week. It says, the next morning, Tuesday morning, as they were leaving Bethany, which was a city, not a person, Jesus was hungry. <laughs> Amen? Jesus experienced hunger, and some of you here this morning experiencing hunger. Jesus was hungry. I love the details that the gospel writers give us. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off, so he went over to see if he could find any figs. Apparently, he's going to have some fig breakfast. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Some of you are like, finally, the Bible sees me. Validating all those times I was really hangry. Jesus was hangry too. <laughs> or was he? When they arrived back in Jerusalem, so they left Bethany, they're on their way to Jerusalem. The whole fig tree thing happens. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, so things are already a little off kilter. Jesus is cursing fig trees. When they arrive back in Jerusalem, things don't get any better. When they arrive back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you've turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. I told you it wasn't going to get any better. When they were afraid, but they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. That evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, you thought we were done with the fig tree, didn't you? The next morning, they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, and the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the tree you cursed has withered and died. And all God's people said, Amen. what in the world? <laughs> huh? Say what? what what's crack a and What's going on? What's happening on Tuesday of, of Passion Week? Um, Lord Jesus, we need help today. We need help understanding. We need help making sense of. Uh, we need wisdom. We, we need insight. We we need a fresh revelation of the Holy Spirit to bring life to this story again. To understand what you're trying to communicate to us in 2023. So Lord, would you lead us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, you you got to admit it's a little disorienting on Tuesday of Passion Week. What do we do to make sense of Jesus on the one hand, seeming to be a little hangry, but on the other hand, we know there's got to be more to the story. We just don't know what the more is. And then in the middle of this, what I like to call a fig tree sandwich is, is this whole temple scene. And, and, and so understandably, there's a little bit of difficulty mixed into what do we make of Jesus cursing a fig tree? Lightheartedly, it's, uh, it, it, we like to, I like to, to kind of say, you know, maybe he was a little hangry that morning. Jesus woke up on the wrong side of bed and breakfast wasn't what he wanted. And I don't know if you've ever been in that situation when you woke up and you're a little hungry and then a little hungry turned to a little hangry. Then it didn't matter what was put in front of your plate. You didn't want to eat any of it because none of it was satisfying the soul or the belly. I can't be the only one who's experienced that or somebody in my close relationships like that. There's got to be other people that turn hangry in this room. But was Jesus really experiencing a, 
uh, about a, a, a hanger or was, or was something more symbolic going on in the story Be, because Luke, or I'm sorry, Mark does take the fig sandwich and he puts it one on the top, one, one layer of bread on the top. He puts one layer of bread on the bottom and in the middle, he puts the meaty temple scene. And, and so what Luke is, what Mark is doing, I'm going to get this right before the end of the service. It's Mark we're talking about, not Luke. What Mark is doing is putting bookends on this story, and in essence, the meaning of the fig tree finds its real fulfillment and understanding in the story of the temple. So Jesus wasn't just walking by one day uh, saying, well, I'm kind of hungry. Well, I'm going to get mad and curse this tree because there's no figs on it. No, 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 no. He, this is a prophetic picture that gives understanding to what's about to happen. And then he he helps us at the end of the story to understand what just happened. So he makes a fig tree sandwich out of this temple scene story. And in essence, what we see is that this fig tree is a picture of a fruitless temple. The fruit that was intended for the temple to produce It wasn't producing what God intended it to produce. It was lacking the fruit that God was wanting it to to, to produce, the temple that is. And just like a tree that is fruitless, it's like Mark is saying, so is this whole temple system that we're about to get into. The, The picture is of a fruitless temple. And just like a fruitless tree, a fruitless temple serves no purpose. Now, the story of the temple scene. There's a lot going on in this scene. I want to try and break it down a little bit. You see, just before this scene on Monday, Jesus and Luke, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 11, verse 11 There must be a spirit anointing on Luke today. we got to figure out what that is. And in Mark chapter 11, verse 11, this is on Monday before Jesus showed up and did this whole temple clearing thing. On Monday, in Mark chapter 11, verse 11, it says, So Jesus came to Jerusalem, and he went into the temple, and after looking around carefully, he left. So Monday happens, Jesus shows up in Jerusalem, he goes to the temple, and he looks around carefully, just observing what's happening in the temple, just taking it all in, seeing what, what's happening over here in the corner, and what is that group over there doing, and what are the religious leaders over here doing, and, and, and what are the, the, the travelers coming in from out of town, because this was a, a high holy week right here, and it was, it was a, a time where people would be coming in, flooding into the temple. A lot of, so what was going on? Jesus takes it all in on Monday, and apparently what he saw on Monday wasn't satisfactory, because on Tuesday when he shows up to the temple again, things get a little out of control, you might say. The scene on Tuesday when he comes back, Jesus apparently creates some chaos, uh, but from another perspective, it looks like maybe Jesus is restoring order to an already chaotic and disordered situation. On the one hand, we see Jesus coming in and throwing tables over. I wanted to have two or three tables up here and just start throwing things. Just to, give you, just to give you a vibe of what it was like, just knocking tables over, chairs over. Because that's how startling it would have been, even in their day, for Jesus to walk in, on, on, even in a church like this, and begin knocking tables over. In fact, in one gospel, it says he quickly wove together some, uh, some cord, created a whip, and started whipping some stuff. I don't, know if he, I don't think he was hitting people, but I think he was whacking it in the air like an Indiana Jones. You know what I mean? It seemed like he was creating chaos on the one hand. But from another perspective, maybe he was restoring order in an already chaotic and disordered situation. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that in your own life. Where when Jesus comes in, it seems like 
when I, begin, when, when, I, when I try and read the Bible, and I haven't been reading the Bible in a while, I try and get back into Bible reading, it's like all hell breaks out against me. Every obstacle that, that can come its way kind of comes up. Every, every, every distraction that, 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 could, that could pop up possibly pops up. The flat tire goes, goes flat, or the tire goes flat. The email comes in. The phone doesn't stop ringing. Every time I try and get, it's like all hell breaks out against me. I, I try and follow Jesus. I want to turn my life around. I've heard about the good news, and, and I, 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 I hear and I see the testimony, and I want that for myself. So I'm going to follow Jesus. So I begin to follow Jesus, and what happens? It's like all hell breaks out. It's like every distraction possible comes up. It's like things begin to happen. Like this wouldn't normally happen if I would just keep living it. If I didn't make the decision to turn, if I just kept doing what I was doing, it was like it's already chaos, but I was, I, was, I was cool with this chaos. But then when I start to get Jesus in it, it's like it gets even more chaotic. But in reality, Jesus is just restoring order to an already disordered situation. And sometimes things have to get a little more crazy before they get a little more Sometimes in life, when we're following Jesus, the situation's going to get a little before it gets a little. Amen. It's going to get a little worse before it gets a little better. Because you've got to get the junk and the stuff out in order to begin walking in the healing of it all. So as we come to Jesus on our journey of transformation, just know that while although from one perspective it feels hard and chaotic to follow him, don't you worry, that's just the healer restoring and renewing and helping you get to a place. It might look chaotic, but from another perspective, Jesus is just in the process of restoring order to an already disordered life. Amen. If you're familiar with the... The, the temple scene, I mean, Jesus walking in on a Tuesday when all the hustle and bustle of life was going on and, and begin the, the, the table flipping. And if you can just hear the sound of coins just flopping all over these, these stone floors, I mean, just hear the clinging and the clanging of it all. The chaos of it all as he knocks stuff over, gets a whip and begins to drive and set the animal, the doves flying around, you know, with their little things and their wings and, and knocking over the, 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 the cages for the lambs. And you got little bah, bah, bah. lambs are going everywhere. <laughs> doves are flying. The money's clinging off the ground. People are all up in arms. It is a mess in the temple right now, folks. It is a statement that Jesus is making. Facts, bro, he is making a statement right now in uh, the Gospel of Mark on Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus is making a statement. And, and part of what's going on, if you're familiar with, with, with the way the temple was structured, you had the temple compound that had a few different courts to it. You had the outer court and a couple inner courts. And then once you got through the outer court and the two inner courts, you got to the temple itself where, where, all, where the only person who could go there were the priest. And inside the temple was the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant was. That was the locale, that was the location, that was the venue, that was the place where God's Spirit dwelt on earth. And from that place, that from the Holy of Holies, that was to give life and vibrancy. That was to inform everything else that was going on in the temple. So what was happening in the inner circle, the Holy of Holies, was to inform what was happening in the outer courts. What was happening in the outer courts was to be a physical, visible demonstration of the character of God's nature that was residing in the Holy of Holies. And the religious leaders who represented that Holy of Holies were to be demonstrating the character and nature of God in the outer courts that, co co that, that, that aligned with God's nature in the Holy of Holies. Are you following with me this morning? All right, I know I was talking fast. I need to slow down, but I get excited about it. And sometimes my excitement comes out in speed. In the Holy of Holies is where God was dwelling. His character and nature. 
that was to inform and give life to everything happening in the temple. What was happening in the outer courts was to be a visible expression of the character and nature of God that was living in the Holy of Holies. Now, at this time of the year, uh, they were, people needed to bring sacrificial animals, whether it was a lamb or a dove. And people were coming from all over the world, and, and they had different types of coinage. Uh, uh, most of it was, was from the Roman world, and, and they had, you know, they, there were images of, 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 of Caesar on the coinage. And, and so there was a particular type of money that you could only use at the temple. All right, now we're getting to the weeds a little bit, but we need to get into the weeds a little bit. What the people were doing at the money exchangers is that they were charging an exorbitant or rate. They were inflating the numbers so that if you gave one Roman coin, then, um, then that would equal like a half of a Jewish coin or maybe even less. So you had to give more Roman money to get less Jewish money to use at the temple. Are you following with me? They were inflating the numbers, uh, throwing off the currency so that they could make more money instead of just being honest and doing what was right and just. They were inflating the numbers to make more money. And not only were they doing that, but, but they were also, you see, you could bring your own lamb to the temple to sacrifice on behalf of the family. But in order for your, sac for, for your lamb to be sacrificed, it first had to pass an inspection. And, and if you know where we're going here, um, the, the, the priest that would inspect the lamb, even though you've been, you knew that you couldn't bring a lamb with a spot on it to the temple. So you've been preparing this lamb. You've been taking care of this lamb. This lamb has been sleeping right beside you. I mean, if there was a little, little stain on it, you carefully trim the hair. Like, I ain't, ain't going to find nothing on this lamb. This lamb is spotless from anything. It don't walk with a little limp. It walks nice. There's no stain on it. It is beautiful. I've cared for this. My family's cared for it. And now I'm bringing it to the temple to sacrifice on behalf of the family. I'm proud of this lamb because I've been working on this thing. So I bring it to the priest. They're going to inspect it. Oh my goodness, look at that right there. There's a spot. Where's the spot? There ain't no spot on that lamb. There's a spot right there. I don't see it. I don't care. I'm the inspector. There's a spot. So what happens then is they take the spotted lamb that you just brought that ain't really spotted. They put it in a pen and they say, hey, look, here's some lambs right here. You can buy one. And of course, the price of the lamb is outrageous. And behind the scenes, most probably what happened is that spotted lamb that you just brought, when nobody was looking, they just moved it over here to the good pen. So for the next unsuspecting customer that comes in, you see this whole, this whole thing, this temple scene had turned into this economic religious business. Aren't you thankful that nothing like that happens in the church of Jesus Christ today? An economic religious business. You see, Jesus was confronting not people's personal spiritual walks with the Father. He was confronting an economic injustice happening in the temple. He wasn't bringing the fight to people's individual walks with the Lord. He was confronting the system of religiosity that was to represent his character and nature. He was addressing a systemic issue, not a privatized, individualized issue. He was addressing the religious system as a whole and confronting it and saying, what you're doing is unjust. What you're doing is unrighteous. The way that you're manipulating people's giving and money is not in alignment with what's happening in the Holy of Holies. And he addresses the whole temple with all of its functions and priests and all the things going on. Dude, when I, when I began to realize that, I was like, yes, Jesus, come on. I'm so used to a Jesus in Western culture who only cares about me and my walk and my life and how I'm doing with Jesus. But when I read the scriptures, yes, there is a Jesus who cares about me and my walk and my sin and, and, and my restoration and my wholeness. But there's also a Jesus who's not afraid to confront a whole systemic issue and say, what you're doing isn't in alignment with my heart. I thought there might be a clap there. Yeah. 
I just, I just think it's, it's notable that, that we need to note that, that Jesus doesn't make this, this, this kind of private individual matter. Uh, this is a, a public systemic matter in the temple that was intended to be a public service to all people. Instead, it became a self-serving religion benefiting only those who were in power. Before we privatize this message, because we do need to ask some introspective questions. But before we privatize the message, we, we must first hold up the story against the church as a whole and ask. Ask the questions that Jesus was asking. Because the temple that was intended to be a public service to people it became this self-serving religious machine. And, and so we, we hold this up to the Lord and, and we say, Lord, what about us? What about the church of Jesus Christ? Lord, what tables in the church need to be flipped because they've become self-serving religious businessy things rather than God-honoring, life-giving, other-centered service? Because if Jesus walked into the temple in the first century and flipped tables over, let me tell you, he'll walk into the church in the 21st century and flip a couple tables over too. So before he does that, maybe we could go to him and say, Jesus, look at our church as a whole and our, our part in the church and say, Lord, what, what here? I can't control what happens down the street. I can't, get, I can't control what happens in another church, but Lord, what here in our faith family, what tables are in our blind spot that you need to do a little flipping? Because we have, well, we're not holding on to anything except you. You say, well, what, what would that look like? Well, man, I, I'm, I don't know exactly, but I'm just asking the question, Lord, what would there be here? Once we begin to, to look at it from, from that perspective, then we can begin asking some of the more personal questions. Um, what does it mean for us to look at this passage of Scripture on, on Holy Tuesday and, and say, Lord, you're, 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 you're flipping tables, you're driving out uh, uh, money changers, but, but what does that look like for me in my life? You know, there's a passage of Scripture in the Corinthian letters uh, where Paul talks about our bodies. And Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you? That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. And I wonder this morning, as, as we reflect on this passage, if, if we might just say, Lord... What tables are in my life that might need a little flipping? Are there tables that need to be uprooted and flipped over in my life? Are there, are there things that I gravitate to that you don't gravitate to? <laughs> are there things happening on the outer courts of my life that aren't happening in the Holy of Holies that represent you? Oh God, are there things that are not in alignment in my life? Uh, I, when, I, when I hold it up to your character and nature, oh somebody, there's got to be a spot in here where we say, uh, hey, I, I'm a grateful follower of Jesus. I've been delivered from an addiction to pornography, but God's still working on my lack of empathy and my thinking errors and how I privatize and how I how personalize everything. There's still some tables left to be moved, Amen. There's still a table or two that could use a little Jesus flipping. And so, so just asking these questions, Lord, what is it? And, and, and guys, more than just a, a matter of, of private kind of experience with Jesus, it goes a little bit deeper because I think the story, if we're honest with the story, it has less to do with money. It has more to do with God's plan of salvation on earth. And let me tell you how, how, I, how I got to that point. The outer court where all the buying and selling was happening, so, so we typically talk about this story in terms of like, you know, the business and the money and self-serving. And, and those, while those things are true, 
the outer court where they were doing this business was the court of the Gentiles. All right? The court of the Gentiles. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for saying that. That really drives home the point. Really clears everything up today. The court, so I told you, we got to break it down a little bit. The court of the Gentiles. There were three courts, three, three, three spaces where people could uh, go to the, to the temple. The outer court was the court of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, anybody who wasn't a Jew. So all the nations, oh, come on, all the nations were welcome to the temple of God. All the nations. It didn't matter what your skin color was or your religion was. It didn't matter if you followed the law or not. Anybody was welcome to the court of the Gentiles. Beyond that was the court of women. Beyond that was the court of men. Beyond that is where only the priest could go. And so it was structured so that anybody, all nations, whether you're Jew or Gentile, anybody could get, get, could get in on what God was doing at the temple. Anybody could get in on the salvation in the name of Jesus. It was open for everybody. But where they were doing the business, it wasn't in the court of the Jewish women. It wasn't in the court of the Jewish men. It was in the court of the Gentiles. They had turned the outer court of the temple into a marketplace, effectively obstructing the Gentiles from getting into the temple and experiencing the hope, healing, and wholeness of Jesus. They obstructed God's plan of salvation that was to be a welcoming place for all people. They were obstructing it with their tables and their selling and their buying and their money exchanging so that they could, the Gentiles no longer had any room to get into the temple. So Jesus had to clear the stuff to make room for God's plan to keep going on. So Lord Jesus, we just ask you, what tables need to be flipped in order to make room for your plan to continue on. Now, to sum up the story, remember Mark puts this in a fig tree sandwich. Don't forget about the fig tree. He wasn't just hangry at the beginning. It was a prophetic picture. It was a picture of a fruitless tree that was to indicate a fruitless temple. What was the fruit that should have been hanging on the tree? What was the fruit that should have been hanging in the temple? Well, the story doesn't explicitly say, but if we continue reading in the verse, Jesus does say, so after this crazy chaotic scene just happens, verse 22 of Mark chapter 11, Jesus does say this. He says, then Jesus said to the disciples. So I've, I've just created a whip. I've done some whooping. I flipped tables. Change has gone everywhere. Then Jesus said to the disciples, apparently right there in the temple, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must believe it will really happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything and if you believe that you received it, it will be yours. But when you're praying, you must forgive anyone holding a grudge against you so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. The fruit of faith, the fruit of prayer, and the fruit of forgiveness. The fruit of faith, the fruit of prayer, and the fruit of forgiveness. Apparently, from Jesus' perspective, the fruit of faith was missing in the temple that day. A simple trust and reliance upon God to provide what only God can provide. Rather than trying to manipulate people in order to secure financial security, what if, what if the, the religious leaders began to simply trust that we're, as we do things with integrity, our God will provide what we need in order to celebrate and sustain what's happening at the temple? So a simple faith in God, God, I trust you. I trust you to be my provider. I trust you to supply what I need supplied. I trust you, God, that you will be what I need you to be. I'm not going to rely on manipulation or, or, or lies or secrets or, or any other type of unjust way of getting security in life. I'm simply going to return to a trust and a faith in the living God. My God, my God, what if the church of Jesus Christ just came back to a simple trust, just a childlike faith? 
There's no child among us that works too hard at trusting their parent to provide what they need to have provided for them. They just wake up, they eat, they drink, they peep, they poop, they pee, they go back to bed, they wake up again, and the parents still provide for them. It's a simple faith. And if you, don't, if you have the faith of a child, you can enter. But if you don't have the faith of a child, you cannot enter. So God, grace us with a restored, simple, childlike faith. And prayer, what about prayer? This is my Father's house. It shall be called a house of For all the nations. A place where we commune with God. A place where we both talk to God and listen to God. A place of intimacy, a place of togetherness, a place of connection. You see, you see, this was to be a place of relationship, not stale, worn out religion. I think people are tired of stale, worn out religion that just keeps the wheels turning in order to keep the institution going. People are tired of worn out, stale, dry, dead religion. People are hungry for faith-filled, prayer-filled relationship with the living God where we talk to God and we listen to God's voice. So, oh God, let the fruit of prayer abound in the house of Jesus Christ and let it start with me. Let it start with me. The third fruit that apparently was missing in the temple that day was the fruit of forgiveness. The fruit of forgiveness. If you're praying and you remember somebody has a grudge against you, go to that person. Ask for forgiveness. Extend forgiveness. Receive forgiveness. The power of forgiveness is extraordinary. That we would forgive as Christ has forgiven us. There's parables upon parables of us giving forgiveness as we have received forgiveness. And if we don't freely give, it really creates some issues between us and God. <laughs> so as we have freely received forgiveness, let's freely give forgiveness. And in the situation where it wouldn't put you at risk or danger or the other person, it's best to go to that person and offer forgiveness. If it would put you in danger or the other person in danger, just get right with your heart, in your heart with the Lord and give that person forgiveness from your inmost being. Amen. Amen. The fruit of faith, prayer, and forgiveness. They seem to be missing that day. In the temple when Jesus showed up. And I wonder this morning as we look at and observe this story of the temple on Tuesday. I'm thinking it's probably Tuesday afternoon on Holy Week. Such a strange story. Of all the things I would expect Jesus to do leading up to the cross. Cursing a fig tree and flipping tables and throwing money all over the temple and setting the doves free and the lambs go. I wouldn't expect that. But from his perspective, that was part of the restorative process of bringing hope, healing, and wholeness into people's lives. Standing up to the temple as a whole and saying what you're doing is not congruent with my heart and nature. What's happening on the outer courts of the temple is not congruent with what's happening in the Holy of Holies. You might have a blind spot, so let me help you with that blind spot. That's pretty sweet right there, too. There was a lack of fruit that day in the temple. Of faith, of prayer, and of forgiveness. And as the body of Christ, maybe we can simply say, Lord, 
search my heart. Speak to me. Is there a lack of fruit in my own life? Is there a table that you might want to flip? Maybe it's a blind spot. Maybe I know full well what the table is. But I've just been holding on to it. Lord, search our hearts. Let it get a little chaotic in the house of the Lord for a moment. Let the sound of the wings of the doves just flutter and the, the coins on the, the concrete floor. Let, let, let it get a little chaotic in the, in the house because I know that a little bit of chaos is going to come as you restore order and hope and healing. So let's just get real before the Lord and say, God, any table, any limb in my life not bearing fruit, oh God, would you restore? Would you give me the fruit of faith and prayer and forgiveness? Let it abound in my own life. And Lord, may this faith family, may it be a family abounding in faith, a family abounding in trust and prayer and forgiveness so that that outer courts of our faith family would be a welcoming environment for anybody who's broken in this world so that the prodigals could return and find a place of forgiveness. God, fling wide the gates. Bring us the prodigals in this place. Let the Gentiles of the world find a place of healing in this house. God, restore unto us. God, give us the fruit. Woo! Flip a table if you need to flip. We give you full permission, oh God, to do what you need to do. So faith family, I say to you this morning, respond to the voice of the Spirit as you need to respond. If you want to kneel at an altar of prayer, they're open for you. If you need to stand and lift your arms and abandonment and simple trust to the Lord, feel free to do that. If you need to sit and reflect upon the Spirit's voice in your life, feel free to do that. But let's respond to the Word of God this morning and to the voice of the Spirit in Jesus' name.